Ever since one of the pesky dame's mothers came over to my channel and left comments about her daughter and those pesky dames, I've taken a personal interest in this channel. You see, the pesky dames are so very bad at absolutely everything. I thought these young ladies could certainly do with some of my world-class tutelage. I know you MRAs, you're gonna say that I'm white knighting. Guilty as charged, man. Guilty as charged. So let's just, let's just see what the latest video has to say. I'm Lucy Pedrick, women's counsellor at Sheffield University Students' Union and a feminist. A couple of weeks ago, I was a delegate from my SU to the National Union of Students National Conference. We debated Motion Proposal 701, which sought to balance gender on conference floor. Despite women making up 60% of NUS membership, last year only 30% of delegates were women, although this year the figure was 40%. Understand I know nothing about British parliamentary procedure, so enlighten me. How were these delegates selected? Were, was it orders handed down from on high, you know, perhaps some sort of inbred prince uh, chortling and saying, oh yes. That man, that man, that man, oh, just on a whim, that woman, those two men, and then that other man. Or are they elected somehow? Like, are students able to cast votes? In which case, the better question would be, how come women don't like women? The motion proposal wanted to ensure that all member unions have to send an equal amount of men and women to conference. I see, and that's important for some reason. Could you share the reason that's important? The only reason I ask is because... Well, you're sort of going against the ostensible will of the people and undermining the concept of democracy as a whole. So, I mean, there's a good reason. Let's go ahead and do it. As part of the debate around the motion, a number of points were raised that I think might be worth talking about. So here goes. Number one, quotas are not patronizing. Yeah, I'm sure that is what you said after somebody rightly pointed out, man, quotas, that's pretty fucking patronizing. I mean, it's like saying, <laughs> You couldn't get elected under any circumstances unless we just force you into these positions. Because, I mean, listen to you, nobody's going to elect you. You're lame. I'm sorry, go on. A number of women made the point that with quotas, some women at conference might feel that they've been elected on the basis of their gender rather than their policy and that this is patronising. Well, if the number of female delegate, delegates is manipulated to produce a greater proportion of female delegates by selecting for sex, then it's really just a matter of probability whether any particular woman was elected on the basis of her gender or her policy. In reality, of course, nobody is elected on the basis of their policy. It's all about personality. Let's just say it's policy. Point being, any particular woman ha would have good reason to have such doubts because uh, at least some of those women would be elected for no other reason than your bigoted policy. Here's the first thing. The mandate that any delegate at NUS has is horrifically flimsy at best. First, hardly any students vote in delegate elections. Second, in our brief statement that we're elected on, we by no means articulate our stance on the incredibly broad range of policies that we're expected to vote on at conference. Uh, welcome to every single kind of election everywhere. That's democracy. I know that I made a brief statement of why I believed NUS conference is important, and then outlined as laconically as possible my basic experience. Gee, no kidding, you're laconic to the point of catatonic. Let me just go ahead and patronizingly educate you about the very nature of life. Alright, the ability to sell things is not, uh that easy to learn, but it is something that everybody should learn. And when I say to sell things, I don't mean just like sell things door to door or sell cars, I mean like the way politicians sell things, the way any persuasive speaker will sell things. Now, here's the thing, yeah, none of you delegate candidates can espouse every single position that you hold, so how do we determine who to vote for? Well, you know, you could say that democracy is pretty silly and you know, it doesn't even work, but if you're going to even bother with the whole process, let's roll with it. What is the determining factor? Well, who has the most passion? Who wants it more? Who feels the most strongly about the cause and is willing to stand on their principles? How, do you, how can you possibly determine that? Well, who is willing to put the most effort into 
it. What takes a lot of effort? Learning sales ability, learning persuasive speaking. If you just get up there with your mouth breathing and laconically just blather on in a totally unengaging way having not learned these skills and I see this other candidate for delegate who has a lot of energy, piss and vinegar, joie de vivre, je ne sais quoi, lots of other French words, who do you think I'm going to vote for? I'm going to vote for that guy because he has put work into it. You just got up there and started talking. Did those who opposed the gender balancing motion think that I was elected on the basis of my policy, they are delusional. In no way did my brief profile indicate how I might vote on a motion about free education, let alone my position on offender learning policy in FE colleges, boycotting the NSS or abolishing NUS zones, to name a few that we were asked to vote on. Ergo, a gender quota would not be patronising in shifting the validity of our delegacy from policy to gender, since our delegacy as it stands is far from democratically legitimate. To reiterate, by that standard, no democracy is democratically legitimate. But let me ask you this, is it democratically legitimate? If there is a man, I don't even know what your system is, but so bear with me, a man who has taken the time to learn how to speak to people, how to reach people, how to relate to people, become charismatic, build a way to just, you know, found a way to draw people in and make them want to elect him. And he's taken all this time and trouble and then he runs to be a delegate, whatever that is, and then a bland-ass turnip of a human being with all of the charisma of a tree stump runs against him, but because you have a vagina, you get elected. Is that democratically legitimate? So number two, quotas work. In Sheffield last year, we almost sent a delegation to a national conference of seven men plus our president, also a man. In response to this, our women's officer at the time brought a motion that we instigate a gender balancing policy. Wow, 60% of y'all are women, not one woman elected? Wow. The people have spoken. Our delegation this year was four women and three men, plus our president, a man. So quite clearly, on the numbers, quotas work. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. When you say work, what exactly do you mean? I know. Why, what does it accomplish? I mean, yes, there it equalizes the number of men and women, but that's that kind of a tautology, like saying quotas work by fulfilling the quotas we've set. Like, explain to me how this system is now better, considering you've corrupted your democracy. We're a union which is 54% women. In what universe is it democratically representative to send a delegation which is 100% men? Obviously a lot of the women voted for men, then men were elected, and it sounds like democracy to me. Uh, this universe? But it's not just about the numbers. The figures show that three out of four of our women delegates this year would have been elected irregardless of the quote. Did you seriously just fucking say irregardless? Okay. So what does that mean? Firstly, it means that only one of four women delegates was elected on her gender rather than her policy. But it also indicates that because structural inequality exists, women are sometimes put off from running for something because they perceive their gender as a barrier to their success. You know, you're, you are absolutely right. What about all of those delegates-to-be who were going to run, but they're so fucking timid and pathetic that their perceived mental barriers stop them. Yeah, we... What am I thinking? We can't exclude those. We gotta get those women elected. I mean, because they'll stand strong on their positions. Principled people. Quotas are, are a way of restricting that structural inequality by placing an alternative structure in its place. Interestingly, when asked whether they would have stood without the quotas, most, but not all, of the women candidates for election said that they would have stood anyway. Okay, so only one in four women would be put into the delegate position because they were women. And most, but not all, women would have stood anyway. So you're really making a pretty good case for not having quotas. I don't know if you realize that. 
But that doesn't mean that women in future years who may not have stood previously might stand now having seen a woman win as a direct result of the quota. You sound kind of like a misogynist, the, you know, saying that women need to be herded like cattle. Number three, the NUS already uses quotas. At NUS liberation conferences, there are national quotas in place. For example, at NUS Women's Conference, at least one delegate from each union must define as black, and one is either LGBT or disabled. Uh, and if nobody is disabled, does somebody get Nancy Kerrigan? I'm sorry, you're British, you won't understand the reference. Somebody gonna get their kneecaps busted? Anyway, I've covered all the main points. The rest of it's just like, well, everybody else does it, ergo it is correct. So, uh, TTFN.